how quickly we forget and move on. As Star Wars series are coming in abundance, we as fans tend to look ahead or at what's right in front of us. I've been guilty of this as well, and it's no fault of our own. The franchise is just growing faster than anyone had ever anticipated. When Disney bought Star Wars and Lucasfilm from George Lucas in 2012, we didn't imagine it being series made for television that would cause our tunnel vision. Again, not our fault. We were told from the beginning that it would be the films that would grab our attention. But that didn't really pan out. As of that time, Disney Plus had not been announced and Disney XD was the big platform for new Disney series. Okay, in the case of Star Wars, it was just animation at the time, with Star Wars Rebels being the first. Since then, we've had multiple Star Wars series released. The Mandalorian, Resistance, The Clone Wars Season 7, The Book of Boba Fett, the Obi-Wan Kenobi series, and of course the Cassian Andor series. That isn't to mention the other animations, Tales of the Jedi, The Bad Batch, and Visions. There's been so much, but it seems that with every new release or announcement of a new series, we become focused on that, forgetting what had come just a couple of months or even years prior. That is why I've decided to do a series where I go back in time to discuss some of our favorite moments from past Star Wars projects and do an in-depth analysis of each episode like I've never done before. I did it with the Book of Boba Fett and the Obi-Wan Kenobi series last week, to a lesser degree but not as in-depth as I will be going from this point forward. So this week we are going to begin our focus on the Cassian Andor series, starting with episode one titled Cassa. But before I move on, a quick word from me. Hit the subscribe button and give the video a thumbs up. Also consider joining the channel as a member where you'll get exclusive access to the Star Wars fan fictions I'm writing, revolving around Order 66. And don't forget, super thanks are now live. With that said, back with today's topic. I know that revisiting Star Wars series after they're gone tends to draw less attention than continuously beating on what's in front of me, or any new news. But I don't really report on news and rumors. There are enough channels out there that do that, and maybe one day I'll do that in the future when I have more time to expand. But be that as it may, I am revisiting the Cassian Andor series anyway. And I challenge you all to go back and watch it using the tools I'm giving you. Now that the entire first season is out, it can be binged. Maybe even some of you will see it in a different light. And this is a collaboration. I've teamed up with DR the Memer to bring you something truly special. I now give you Andor Episode 1, Casa. From the opening scene of the first episode titled Casa, we see this show is going to be so much different than anything in the recent history of Star Wars. And the opening really does set the tone for that episode and the 11 others that follow. The opening of the series starts off dark, but it does something no other Star Wars project has. It uses BBY as a starting date for the timeline. If you didn't know, BBY stands for Before the Battle of Yavin, which is the ending battle of A New Hope. So the Cassian Andor series begins five years before A New Hope. In fact, unless you're a diehard Star Wars enthusiast, the timeline can seem really confusing. With Andor being five years before A New Hope, the Mandalorian set five years after Return of the Jedi and The Force Awakens being 30 plus years following Return of the Jedi, it's hard to keep everything straight. But Andor did that. It gave us a time frame. Not just so we know what year we're looking at, but it also gives us a point of reference of what the Empire would look like during this time and the state of the Star Wars galaxy. With no solid Rebel Alliance and only minor pockets of resistance, it also gives us a clear indication that the Jedi are gone, all with three letters and a number, BBY-5. Once the timeline is shown, we're taken to a place in our minds that seems despairing. It's dark, wet, dreary, and an indication of the state of the galaxy. Especially those planets who were almost forgotten about. And the Preox Morlana corporate zone of Morlana 1 is such a place. As a hooded Cassian Andor walks the long dock, we see the city in the background, with the clouds being thick and heavy. One would expect to see the city lights reflecting on them, but no, 
The lights of the city are even too dim to shine on the dark clouds which hover just above the cityscape. The pinnacles of the buildings narrowly missing the blackness. The dock holding Cassian is no different. Hundreds of lights line the walkway. Yet, there is barely enough light emitting to show safe passage or a hiding threat. And the threat is there, unseen at the moment. The threat reveals itself within the city's boundaries. It looms. It hides in plain sight. It's oppressive and suffocating. When Cassian Andor is introduced to a pair of Preox Morlana security thugs, we think, this can't be the danger we've been sensing. Sensing it almost like a Jedi. But no, these two are nothing more than cronies, wannabe Imperials with delusions of grandeur, left on a planet to be forgotten, unworthy of the Imperial brand with their ill-fitting, cheaply made uniforms. Their job is merely to keep the corporate zone secure, not police it, and definitely not be in the leisure zone in uniform. But their pay is as meager as their titles and their lack of status within the Empire. But this time, they will try to shake down the wrong person, and it will cost them their lives. Once Cassian Andor has dispatched the thugs, we immediately understand why this series was made for him. In Rogue One, a Star Wars story with Cassian Andor, we were almost able to overlook his character. Sure, he seemed ruthless, but there was something about him that made us question why he was getting his own show. And then the first scene of the Andor series were shown immediately. Cassian is that danger we felt when we first saw the scene open. He is the dreary discomfort. As Cassian runs back to his ship, he carries the heavy darkness with him, just as he brought it. But he knows he messed up. He knows he let his better judgment flitter away once again. His only chance is to run and hide before his crime is discovered. We then travel to Ferrix, another forgotten planet under the reign of the Empire. It, too, is heavy with emotion. Although it is brighter than what we saw of Morlana 1, there is still a gloom. The light that is present is unable to fully penetrate the dark smoke and thick clouds. The fog hangs in the air following every footstep Cassian Andor takes. There's no vegetation to be seen. Instead, the ground is covered in loose dirt dirt that clings to anything brave enough to disturb it. But the darkness didn't always follow Cassian. In his youth, his home planet of Canari was teeming with life, full of vibrant forests and covered in sunshine. The absence of any adult supervision doesn't weigh on the youths of Canari because they have each other. There's no threat they can't take head on up to this point. But curiosity may change that. But for now, there is safety in their numbers and survival has been learned and perfected. Now, Cassian Andor isn't that child surviving in the wilderness anymore. He's a man with consequences for his actions. Actions of his most recent endeavor on Morlana 1 may have caught up to him. With an angle to the camera, as Cassian is awakened by B2EMO, we feel something is off. The crooked camera angle tells us this is an unsettled man. A crooked camera angle for a crooked character. Not crooked in an evil sense, but twisted by the galaxy he lives in. Contorted into something unfamiliar to those who care for him. As his friends are earning honest livings in repair shops or scrapyards, Cassian Andor chooses a life of chaos and instability. A life of petty theft, or worse. Returning to Morlana 1, the Deputy Inspector Cyril Karn brings the urgent report that two of their men were killed in the leisure zone the night before. The dreariness of the night before has lifted, and the sun is shining bright, bright enough to illuminate the office. But Chief Inspector Hine wants the matter dropped. Only reading the report, the superior officer deduces precisely what had happened, but he wants the men to be honored, lied about. But this doesn't settle well with Deputy Inspector Cyril Karn. He wants the culprit found and brought to justice. Cyril decides to take the matter upon himself. He's met with an unenthusiastic response. Most Primor security agents don't want to get involved in a skirmish on Ferrix. As I've pointed out in the first episode of the Cassian Andor series, any time Cassian is around, the climate is either dreary, cold, or both. It's darkest when he is committing a sin against himself. This shows that he carries a weight, the weight of a cold heart with a dark history. Even though his friends care for him, 
it's obvious that the feelings are not mutual, at least on the outside, in this point in time at least. Even his droid is a sad shell of what he may have been at one time. Cassian Andor has no great ambition, just to lay low and hope his missteps don't catch up with him. In this episode, finding his sister seems to be of some importance, but he can't continue his search in the open by being a wanted man, and the blackness surrounding him almost guarantees he won't be successful. Maybe one day, when he learns how to be selfless, he'll figure it out. Cyril Karn, the deputy inspector of the Primor Security Force, is shown differently, longing for something more than what he's been given. He has his uniform tailored to him, both because he has a certain amount of style and he mimics the uniforms he sees the Imperial officers wearing. His cheaply made, ill-fitting uniform isn't complimentary of his style nor the lack of motivation the others have who wear the same uniform around him. Cyril Karn is ambitious, surrounded by light, showing that his intentions are well meant and that he just wants justice for a double murder. He is pure, although a little naive. He's ready to charge in, out in the open, and feels he should be respected for the title he carries. Another delusion of grandeur, I suppose. Knowing what we know from the second episode on, the Empire doesn't care about him. The Empire that he holds dear. He's just a lackey. Disposable and unimportant. But the light surrounding him assures him that he is more than what anyone thinks of him. And we will get more into that when we look at further episodes. The Cassian Andor series is some of the best written Star Wars content in many years. The acting is superb. The dialogue and writing stand up against almost anything that could possibly compare to it. There are no super-powered Jedi or ultra-evil Sith. Average people standing up against oppression, with one man in the center who couldn't care any less about a greater good, only his own survival a survival made difficult by his own choices and mistakes. The characters are rich, and the world-building of the show leaves nothing to be desired. As George Lucas said, Star Wars isn't about spaceships. It's about family. And the Andor series showcases that with the hodgepodge family that tries to get the rebellious Cassian Andor to do the right thing. Join me next time as I revisit the second episode of the Cassian Andor series titled That Would Be Me. Don't forget to hit the subscribe button and give the video a thumbs up. And th a big thank you to DR the Memer for helping this video become possible. But that's all I have for today. Until the next video, this is Gerald, a Star Wars fanatic, signing off. Wishing you all great health, happiness, and peace. Thank you all for watching, and remember, this is the way. And positivity in the Star Wars fandom is the only way.